day two of Agenda 22, the Pearson Centre Fall Conference on the priorities that the new parliament and government should be attending to in the year, in next year and the year ahead. My name is Andrew Cardozo and I'm president of the Pearson Centre. I want to start by recognizing that the Pearson Centre is headquartered on the traditional lands of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe peoples and we welcome our speakers and audience who are joining us from across Turtle Island. As you may know, the Pearson Centre is a leading progressive think tank that addresses the social and economic issues of the day. We make a point of bringing people together from all political parties, business, labour, academia, um, civil society groups and other experts to talk about the issues that are important. As we like to say, we bring people and ideas together. Um, a special thank you to our donors, which include many of you here today. Um, and sponsors, especially our sustaining sponsors, who are the Canadian uh, Building Trades Unions, the International Association of Firefighters, MAPCO Ontario's professional employees, and our goal sponsors for this conference, which include uh, Bruce Power and Mr. Charles Coffey. Uh, just briefly on the format, uh, we have actually two sessions that will go on, one for the first hour and then a second for a half hour. Um, for the first session, we will have we will have a discussion with the panel for about 45 minutes and then go to questions from you, the audience. So please use the question box on your screen and send in your questions and we'll get to as many as we can. And this session will end at 4.30 uh, Eastern time and then we go into a second session uh, for a half hour, which will focus on the prairies and Western Canada. So today we have an, uh, a, an exciting panel of Canadians who work in various fields and have addressed economic uh, recovery and economic growth in various ways. Uh, Peggy Nash is a former New Democratic Party member of Parliament for Parkdale High Park, and during that time she served as her party's critic for finance and for industry. Before entering politics, she was a negotiator with Canadian Auto Workers, uh, now known as Unifor. Uh, she's also currently chair of the Centre for Labour Management Relations at Ryerson University. Uh, Brian Kingston is president and CEO of the Canadian Vehicle Manufacturers Association, an organization that is at the forefront of Canada-US trade issues that we're debating right these days. Um, they're also at the forefront of the advancement to ele electric vehicles, EVs, and the green economy. Prior to joining CVMA, he spent several years in senior roles at the Business Council of Canada and in the Government of Canada. Uh, he recently penned a column with Jerry Dice in the Hill Times uh, that put the case forward that Canada should really be planning to be an automotive superpower, and we'll get to that during our discussion. Professor Ian Lee is an associate professor at Carleton University uh, at the Sprott School of Business, back on our on our screen for by popular demand. I'm glad uh, that we were able to get him today. He's often uh, in between classes that he teaches a lot of media appearances on radio and television, and he also teaches the EMBA in many countries around the world, including Poland, Russia, Ukraine, Mexico, and the United States. So this session will go till 4.30. At that time, we will have that uh, discussion I, meant, I mentioned on, on Western issues. We will be talking with the Honorable Jim Carr and Sandra Puputello, and I will introduce them at that time. Our co-moderator for the first session is Don Arsenault, He's a Pearson Centre board member. He's a former MLA from New Brunswick and served in various portfolios, including um, post-secondary education, training and labour, energy and mines, uh, certainly issues that are very much related to our discussion today. He recently announced that he will be a candidate for the leadership of the Liberal Party of New Brunswick. So he's a politician who left politics and wants to be a politician again. Um, so great to have you work on this with me today, Don. Um, what I'll do is to start with the first question and, and then uh, turn over to Don. So um, what I'll ask uh, the panel, and, and Peggy, I'll start with you. Or, or sorry, no, I'll, I'll start with Ian and then go to Peggy. Um, before we get to the recovery and growth, I wonder if you could each just tell me your thoughts about where things stand today. Some of the things that people are talking about most these days are worker shortages, supply chain uh, problems and inflation. Um, what, what are the current problems this, you know, right now in the next few months? Ian, I'll start well, with you. Okay, thank you. And thank you for inviting me. This is a, a very important uh, topic and a very distinguished panel I, I'm on uh, uh, sharing this with today. Um, 
the I'm going to be a bit provocative, although I believe me, I, I mean what I'm saying. I, I believe that the pandemic is over. I'm not trying to trivialize the infections, the infection rates, people that are still becoming ill from COVID, which is a horrible, horrible illness. Uh, I'm, I've uh, been fully vaccinated. I uh, completely believe that that's the way out. But and when you look at the economic data, uh, you know, the, the job creation, you look at the GDP growth rate, you look at the inflation numbers, which the Federal Reserve finally agreed earlier this week is no longer transitory. It's becoming embedded. And you look at the unbelievable number of job vacancies, which are a threat to recovery. Clearly, we're in a post-pandemic phase. And so that's good news. That is really good news. The, the question is, uh, what are we going to do? How are we going to respond to this post-pandemic uh, uh, period? Uh, and are we going to uh, make mistakes? Uh, how are we going to deal with the job vacancies? Uh, because they are, I think, they're going to be harming increasingly, harming the recovery going forward. Uh, what are we going to do about inflation, which affects ordinary people? And it's a truism that inflation hurts the poorest people the, the most. And so these are very important issues. But the, the good news, and I'll wrap up on this, the good news is that the worst is behind us. It's not that light is at the end of the tunnel. I think we've, uh, uh, we're at the end of the tunnel and we're uh, moving out into the sunshine uh, again. Okay, thank you, Ian. Uh, Peggy, what are your thoughts on, on the question of where we are uh, these days? Well, I, I applaud Professor Lee on his optimism. Um, I, I'm not so sure we're at the end, maybe we're at the beginning of the end, but really, while most of the world remains unvaccinated, I think we all remain susceptible to these uh, COVID variants and that will continue to perhaps not shut countries down as it has before, but it will create a sense of insecurity and I think that will uh, give pause to some business investment. I think it will uh, uh, add additional pressure to people's daily lives. I think we are still in an affordability crisis, whether it's homes or um, uh, low pay, whatever you want. Um, certainly a, a lot of people are living paycheck to paycheck. I think that is a key issue. I think we're in a care crisis where we've seen, whether it's long-term care or child care, that there are a lot of concerns, uh, or healthcare generally, mental health, there are a lot of concerns about care. And we are, of course, in a climate crisis, and that demands our attention, both from an industrial development sector, but also generally from a decarbonization approach. Uh, and I would just argue that we have a huge job ahead in terms of Indigenous reconciliation, that this is a, a pressing problem that remains uh, on the front burner and demands our attention. All of these issues are linked um, and linked to the pandemic. And as long as this pandemic is kind of rumbling along, I don't think we are fully out of it. So, so despite the the good numbers that that uh, Ian Lee was was referring to, your concern, of, your, your thought is that things are pretty uncertain at the moment. I think there's there's still uncertainty about where we're going. I don't know about you. I'm not going to book a vacation anytime soon in in terms of getting on a plane and traveling across the world. Before the pandemic, I was. Uh, doing some work in Africa and, uh, and, and in Caribbean. I'm not going to do that now. I think that there are still, you know, we, we in a way are some, some parts of the country are somewhat insulated, but um, I, think, uh, I think while there has been a recovery here, I think it remains fragile in terms of uncertainty about variants of COVID. And I hope I'm wrong. I hope we are near the very end because like everyone, I am sick to death of it. I want it to be over. And and I want that certainty in my life. I want to be able to plan things. But uh, I'm concerned that we may not be at that point. I hope I'm wrong. Okay. Uh, Brian, we'll get to talk about the automotive sector in a few minutes, but I wonder if you could share with us your, your thoughts about the economy in general at, as we stand these days. 
Sure. Well, I'll uh, I'll start with some some good news, and then I'll turn to the bad news. And I do bring an auto focus, given the uh, the importance of the industry, and you know I would argue the health of the auto industry is important to the health of the Canadian economy, given that uh, motor vehicles are our second largest export. So, to Ian's point, uh, we have seen uh, demand really increase, uh, not not just uh, in the auto industry, but uh, across the Canadian economy as the pandemic has. Um, you know, gone through, we, we're, we hopefully are through uh, the successive lockdowns and vaccination rates are high. Because Canadian savings rates skyrocketed due to being locked in houses for such a long time, we are seeing a lot of Canadians going out making significant purchases, including motor vehicles, and obviously the housing market's another good example of that. So there's a lot of pent up demand, and it's and that you're seeing that money out into the market right now. However, um, we've got a lot of challenges that we haven't worked through that were triggered by the pandemic. The most obvious one uh, from an auto perspective is supply chain challenges. And, you know, the se semiconductor issue is the most obvious one, uh, but we've witnessed shortages throughout the supply chain. You know, at one point, there was a, a shortage of plastic materials because of the storms in Texas. Now we've had the, the very tragic flooding situation in BC, which has closed down the port and, and put serious challenges uh, on the uh, rail and uh, and trucking supply chain. So these are major, major headwinds facing industry that's trying to respond to increased demand and isn't able to keep up. If you drive by any motor vehicle uh, dealership lot, you'll see that there aren't many cars sitting on the lots right now because we simply don't have the inventory to meet this increase in demand. So encouraging that there is uh, some pent up demand out there in the market, but some serious challenges. Just to touch on the labor point, just to give you an example from the auto industry, we're looking at a potential shortage of 45,000 workers in the industry alone as we head towards 2030. And that's largely being driven by retirees. That's simply replacement of existing employees. So, you know, that's just a one industry in Canada, but imagine that compounded across the Canadian economy. We've got a major labor challenge facing us. And the fact that immigration was reduced during the pandemic is is going to, it's not something that you can just kind of turn the switch back on and, and have the labor supply increase again. So I can dig into all of that as we get into the conversation, but good news and bad news. Yeah, and we only have an hour, so I'm, I'm sure we can go on for hours and hours uh, on these issues, very important issues. So if I were just to, to delve in, so there's many sectors that have been affected by uh, the pandemic. So Peggy, I'll start with you. So what sectors has been the most affected? Uh, and, and what other sectors, um, who needs he needs more assistance? Uh, because mm -hmm. obviously the government can't continue what they've been doing for the past year and a half. So uh, where should the focus be? Well, I guess it depends who you speak with, but uh, certainly small business has been hit very hard. And um, uh, a lot of small businesses are still kind of hanging on by their fingernails. Many have already folded, but a lot are, are hanging on. But if we go into another lockdown, that, of course, will be a deal breaker for many more. So small business, obviously travel and tourism has been hit very hard and I think that um, for the foreseeable future I think there's there's still going to be some reliance on government assistance in uh, in those areas um, and as as Brian said in, in industry supply chain issues have been a problem and um, I think what we've seen are some some areas where perhaps Canada has relied on global suppliers and we really got caught short by this and I'm thinking about whether it's medical equipment or um, um, or or parts for cell phones and automobiles the whole chip component piece so um, I think you know, and maybe it's my background with the automakers union, but I think that the transition to a decarbonizing economy is going to need significant government support uh, to make that transition. It's not just for companies to make investments. I think it's also for workers to be able to retrain and get into these 
uh, new developing jobs. And the last area I'll say is uh, care, uh, long-term care especially. If there's ever a sector that was shown to be deficient and uh, in need of a transition, it is long-term care. There's, of course, a labor shortage there, partly because of poor wages and conditions, but um, there, there are significant issues in terms of quality of care and funding. So I suppose it depends who you speak with. <laughs> Actually, I'm glad you brought up the Karen agenda because I do have a question on that a little bit later, but uh, thanks for bringing that up. Uh, Professor, do you, do you agree with Peggy on what areas are, are most affected and, and where we need help? Um, I Partially, yes. I mean, I, I cannot disagree that in the, uh, where there's high human interface or high human contact, personal contact, which of course means uh, restaurants and bars and, and, uh, and travel, uh, the travel industry. But I would caution, and, and I'm sorry for, I guess I'm the, uh, the skunk at the garden party, but uh, my fear is, and I'm not suggesting people shouldn't get, receive help, of course. I mean, with unanimity, I think, in Canada on that. But my fear in terms of support for business uh, in the small business sector is that uh, Chris, Ms. Freeland, Minister of Finance, is going to have to tread a very, very fine line. Between, and, and it comes down to a judgment. Who are we going to save and who are we not? Because we're not going to be able to save all those small businesses. There are going to be businesses that fail. Uh, and because they're no longer viable. And, and the risk is, is that we're gonna say, well, we'll try and save them all and we're going to start uh, uh, saving so-called zombie corporations. Zombie corporations are corporations that have no competitive advantage. They've lost their way. They're, they're only surviving on the, the subsidies. And so we're going to, they, the finance minister, is going to have to develop programs that discern and separate and provide support for those businesses that are viable. They just need help to make it over the transition, as opposed to creating uh, or sustaining zombie corporations that are no longer viable. That's why we invented, we, our society, invented the Bankruptcy Act over 100 years ago, which is considered one of the most innovative innovations in the history of capitalism in 300 years. We used to put people in debtor's prison back at the time of Charles Dickens in the 1800s. We don't do that anymore. In other words, we restructure organized companies that are insolvent and we put them into, we, we liquidate them to release those assets back into the economy where they can be productive again. And so that's a very tough job that is facing Ms. Freeland. I don't envy her in developing a program of support to support those businesses and individuals who truly do need support as opposed to those businesses and maybe individuals that don't need the support because there are for example a million vacancies out there and i, I think she's going to have to support on the one hand while encouraging people to return to the workforce on the other and this is going to be a very very tough and very difficult balancing act good points brian are you a zombie industry <laughs> Absolutely not. Absolutely not. No, we've we've got to work ourselves through this semiconductor situation. That's that's the the most immediate challenge. Just to give you a perspective of how significant that is. And and look, there's there's not necessarily a role there for for government. This is something that business is working on, and particularly uh, at the U.S. right now, there's a, a huge effort afoot to build more U.S. capacity in semiconductors, which is something that has primarily been dominated uh, by Asia. But we're looking at about eight million vehicles that will not be built this year. Eight million in North America alone, because we do not have semiconductors uh, in abundant supply. Now, you know, auto is a big uh, user of semiconductors, but so, you know, to Peggy's point, cell phones, TVs, video game systems, literally everything that we use nowadays uh, is driven by a semiconductor. So um, that's, that's the immediate priority for us is getting through that supply crunch, which will bring production up and then it will drive employment. What we're going to need assistance on going forward, and this is this is probably uh, taking us to the next topic, so I won't go too far, but the government has set a very ambitious target of effectively making all uh, vehicle sales in Canada to be zero emission vehicles by 2035. Uh, sounds like a long time, but that's a very short uh, time horizon for that to happen. This is a, a once in a lifetime transformation of an industry from a gas powered uh, vehicle through to uh, electrical and you know basically uh, 
derived off critical minerals. So um, uh, we're going to need a much clearer plan from government on how that transition is going to happen. Because as I said at the, at the opening, this is a big industry for Canada. It's a huge employer and its success is going to depend on this transition being done in a way that ensures the industry can continue to grow uh, right here in Canada. So, Brian, if I just to follow up on that, uh, what can the government do more in terms of provincial governments and you know, and the federal government for incentives? Like, would that help? Would that, uh, or, or, or is the timeline so you know, time sensitive and there's a big crunch? Um, would would incentives be a benefit or an impediment? Yeah, well, there's uh, two types of incentives that are important here. The first is incentives to attract manufacturing. Good news is we've already seen uh, four General Motors and Stellantis uh, announce $6 billion of new investment into Canada. And over $4 billion of that is dedicated to electric vehicle assembly uh, in Ontario. So that's great news. And that gives Canada a foothold in this transition to electrification. However, the next big piece of it is making sure that consumers actually buy these vehicles. And if you look at the, the most recent data, we're sitting at about 4% of new vehicle sales uh, are zero emission. Uh, so the climb from 4% to 100% in 14 years is significant. There's only one way to do it, and that's through consumer incentives until the price comes down. And uh, mark my words, the price will come down on battery electric vehicles. The technology is advancing rapidly and the companies are investing significantly in this technology. But right now they're more expensive. So telling a consumer who has a $30,000 budget for a vehicle that they need to you know, take their kids to hockey practice, get to work in, and, and give them an option between a, a battery electric vehicle and an ICE, the decision's clear right now, they're still going to go to gas power because that's more affordable. So incentives are a key, key element here and the federal government has a big role to play as do provinces and Ontario is you know, the most notable uh, outlier on that front without any sort of consumer incentive in place. Professor Lee, would you agree that governments needs to step up in terms of offering more incentives for electric vehicles? Uh, no. And I'll explain why. Uh, and, uh, um, I had a feeling. <laughs> well, no, there's a, there's a logic to this. I'm doing a study for the McDonald Laurie Institute right now on the cost of decarbonization. And I argue, and the studies are suggesting this, and it's a meta study looking at other studies that have been done in the US, Canada, or UK. And, and, and yes, we have to decarbonize. Let's be, there can be no ambiguity about that. We've got to go forward. But the 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 puzzle, the part of the puzzle that the, our elected officials of all political parties are not talking about, is that and the chief engineer of Toyota testified just last week before the U.S. Congress, and he's a very highly trained engineer. He said it is impossible to electrify the entire transportation fleet by 2030 because the grid is not ready. And that is just as true of Canada if anybody looks at the Canadian Electricity Association of the 10 provincial utilities, uh, Hydro, Quebec, and Ontario Hydro, and so forth. We are not talking about the rebuilding of the grid, which is going to be massively, massively expensive. If you look at the Royal Bank study that just came out last week from John Stackhouse, the former Globe and Mail editor, they're talking a cost north of $2 trillion. And so I'm not against electrification. I'm not against what Brian is suggesting. I'm saying, and what the chief engineer of Toyota and other people are saying is, we could convert, uh, convince a lot of people to buy electric vehicles and then find out they can't fuel them. Uh, they can't charge them. We saw this last summer in, in, in California where the head of the public, the public utility board was begging people in California, please don't charge your car. You're gonna bring down the grid. And they only have 4% of the cars are, are electric vehicles. So it's not an argument against electric vehicles, it's an argument that we have not built up the grid or the supply side of energy on the grid to displace the oil and gas in Canada, which according to Natural Resources Canada is 75% of the totality of our energy. In other words, electricity, everyone thinks electricity is massive and, and plentiful. Electricity is 20% of the totality of energy used in Canada. Oil and gas is 75%. We've got to get rid of it. Well, to get rid of it, we've got to build massive amounts of wind, solar, nuclear, and then we've got to build wires across Canada because my line is there's no such thing as a wireless grid. Wireless headphones, but no wireless grid. You still need wires to bring the electricity from the power plant down the streets, into the buildings, into the houses, and into the cars. 
and we don't have the electrical grid infrastructure in place and we're not even discussing building it. So that's my problem. We've, we're putting the cart ahead of the horse. Well, Peggy, I'm sure you have an answer for this. <laughs> well, yeah, I hate to put the electric vehicle before the grid, but <laughs> and, and you raise a very good point. But, you know, I guess the way I look at it is we need to do this transition. I, I don't hear anyone arguing against it. We have no choice. You know, after the Second World War, where we had spent uh, massive amounts of money, went into massive debt, we went into even more debt. Why? Because uh, there was a rebuilding that needed to take place. Now, much of it wasn't here. It was in Europe. But there was a rebuilding that had to take place from the ground up. That's what we have to do now uh, mm -hmm. in order to green our economy. We have to invest in infrastructure. We have to invest in buildings in a different way. We have to invest in clean transportation. So this is not a, a small impact right. uh, initiative. It's going to, I believe, it has to transform our society. And there's a cost, obviously, to not doing this. And we see the cost in in BC and fires and floods, we see it around the world. And I think we're going to pay one way or the other. So I, you know, I'm far from an expert on the electrical grid. Uh, I mean, I just see in a very small way as a consumer, the need for charging stations. Yes, the difference in cost in vehicles. So, uh, but that's on a very personal level. But I think everything from the way we build our homes uh, to, to the way we purchase products we have to be thinking about consuming less energy and consuming different kinds of energy. I'm not the expert on it, but all I'm saying is you cannot make this kind of transformation without the involvement of government, without the leadership of government, without a plan in, in collaboration with the provinces, with industry, with various organizations. And, and there has to be some international collaboration as well. So it, it to me, the only equivalency is like the post-war effort where we, you know, it's kind of all hands on deck because the costs of not doing this are massive. Good answer. Uh, just maybe go on another topic about wages and working conditions. And I'll go to the Peggy first, uh, given, you know, your work with the NDP. These are issues that you've pushed, no doubt. Um, you know, we, we talked a lot of, a while ago, you talked about affordability crisis. We, we talk a lot about um, a living wage uh, or raising the minimum wage. Just here in New Brunswick last week, uh, the government announced uh, that they will raise $2 of the minimum wage next year on two stints of $1. Um, has the pandemic opened our eyes to some of this stuff? Um, you know, what, we hear a lot of the stories not saying that that's what happened, but a lot of the stories, the, you know, the, the low, lower wage earners, when they got served, they stayed home a little bit more. And the hospitality and restaurant uh, industry really got impacted and the retail industry and so forth. Maybe your thoughts on uh, wages and, and, and working conditions with uh, low wage earners uh, all across the country. Well, yeah, I think you really said it, Don, that the pandemic kind of shone a spotlight on many of the, the fissures, if you will, within our society. Um, kind of the, the the racial aspect to who who's caring for seniors and who uh, who who's uh, processing our meat and and uh, uh, who's delivering many other kinds of services. Often it was racialized workers. Often it was women uh, who were impacted. And um, I think what it what it showed was the inequities, the insecurity not only financial but also in terms of job security lack of benefits lack of sick pay and for people who worked their hearts out during the pandemic i guess they you know we championed them as heroes and then we asked them to just keep doing it for the same rate of pay and and i want to agree with professor lee on the point that if if a, a restaurant, for example, can't afford to pay a decent wage and still make money, then maybe they've got a bad business model. Um, and I don't, I don't say that lightly. I think it's a horrible thing if you've invested your, your life into a business and you can't make it sustainable. But I, I just think, you know, as a society, 
we generate a lot of wealth. I mean, we have a huge problem, as many countries do, with tax havens and offshore money being salted away. And a lot of people feel the the system is rigged, that that they're being penalized with low wages and benefits and poor working conditions. They pay their taxes and they feel that other people get off scot-free. So I, I think there is a light shining on this. And I think just as we have an opportunity and a, a need to deal with the, the climate issue and a transition, we also have an imperative, I think, to deal with these inequalities. And because if people don't feel the system is working for them, if they feel the system is rigged, I think that is an opportunity for for destabilizing society. I think you start to lose social cohesion. And I don't think that's a positive thing. I think we can do better. Brian, to you, I mean, there's no doubt that people in your industry make higher wages, but I'm sure you have an opinion on on the inequities that Peggy was talking about. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't really say it better better than how Peggy is, has summarized the issue, um, but uh, I totally agree on the importance of a living wage. And look, you know, from from my industry's perspective, auto uh, is is a great employer, and there are high wages uh, in the industry. Um, so in many ways, I think it can be a, a model uh, for for other industries. But as I noted at the outset, even with those higher wages, we're still seeing challenges finding labor. Um, and in particular, there's a real challenge now with finding skilled tradespeople. Um, you know, General Motors, for example, is opening up. Uh, they've restarted truck production at Oshawa, which is fantastic news. Thousands of jobs uh, at Oshawa and finding highly skilled um, uh, electrical engineers uh, and, and other trades is a real challenge in this market. So uh, there are opportunities out there and they're well-paying opportunities um, but I think we have to do a better job when it comes to skilling and you know I know it's been talked about for what feels like ages but trying to encourage more uh, Canadians and young Canadians in particular particularly from diverse backgrounds to enter into the skilled trades it's still for whatever reason not seen as equivalent to a university degree and there's people that have spent you know their whole careers working on this issue and we haven't been able to crack it um, but I think that's hugely important is to stream more Canadians into those careers, which can be very rewarding and, and pay quite well. So, Professor, is it, do we have to increase minimum wage, have a minimum or living wage? Should we have more uh, or social assistance program too generous? Uh, is there, what's your thoughts as a professor? Um, I'm not, I don't get hung up on the minimum wage because very few people work on minimum wage. And I'm saying that as somebody who dropped out of high school 45 years ago and bummed around in minimum wage jobs for the first three years. I know what minimum wage is about, but the vast majority of Canadians, I think it's 93%, do not work at minimum wage. But now I do want to answer your question, Don. And 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 I'm going to say something that may offend some people uh, uh, in terms of the provocativeness of it. but. We did something, we, Canada and the government, in, in the, during the pandemic and over which there was absolutely no conversation or debate from, at least I don't think, uh, occurred in Canada. And when, when the CERB programs were developed, I'm just using CERB as the metaphor or the proxy for all the programs of support, we, and this is what we did not discuss, we suspended one of the most cherished social programs in the history of our country. And it's called the Unemployment Insurance System, the Unemployment Insurance Act. And it has three core principles. Number one, you get paid a percentage of your income when you're laid off. Number two, you must be looking for a job. And number three, you must take it if it's in your in your wheelhouse, in your area of responsibility, uh, uh, your, your experience set. I understand why we did that in the first six months. But what I think we've done unwittingly out of out of compassion for sure, is that because we have not rolled all of those programs back under the umbrella of this extraordinary program, first developed by the Liberal Party, by Mackenzie King. And it, if you look at public opinion polls, the Unemployment Insurance Act has 80, 90% support amongst Canadians. And we, and, and so those, the, the support programs, now that the pandemic, at least in terms of the economic data is over, all the jobs have been recovered, I think it's absolutely essential for the Minister of Finance to say, look, we're gonna to continue to support programs, but they're going to be with under the umbrella of the principles of this cherished social program called the Unemployment Insurance Act. 
and that is going to you must adhere to those three core principles number and we, we may decide we want to pay a higher threshold we may decide we want to revise the unemployment insurance system which i think is going to happen in the next parliament but subject to whatever we pay as that threshold income there's three core principles number one you get paid a percentage not double what you are making or triple what you're making but a percentage of what you're making two it's for a time specific and you have to be looking for a job during that period and thirdly if one comes along you have to accept it and and i and so i i know that there's going to be people saying you're throwing people under the bus well no because if there's no job to to take or to the, to reject you don't have to worry you'll be continue to be supported but i think when you look at a million job vacancies in this country this is affecting all of us we have shortages of nurses we have shortages of electricians we have shortages of the trades and this is not an appeal from me the professor telling everybody to go to school the colleges in our country are doing a phenomenal job and we need more people to go to college to go into the trades where we have these huge shortages and right now i'm suggesting to you that our our social supports are perhaps at the at the margins are incentivizing some people not to return because you know they had a job that they didn't like for example i was certainly in that ex had that experience so i'm not suggesting that people are are lazy i'm not saying that i'm saying we respond to incentives just like a carbon tax you create incentives disincentives and it changes our behavior similarly with the support programs i think they have to be rolled back in under the umbrella and the principles of this 90-year-old social program called the Unemployment Insurance Act. Good points. And, you know, well, I've heard the- Can I jump in on that? Because oh, I have thoughts. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the problem with EI pre-pandemic was that a lot of people couldn't get it. In fact, most people couldn't get it. And what you got was often very low. Um, so, for example, a lot of the people that I was talking about earlier, people in the service sector, uh, people in, in more precarious jobs, people working two and three jobs, a lot of them were completely disqualified. They got nothing. In fact, uh, less than 40% of women in these low jobs got nothing. And uh, when the uh, EI rules were revised and improved, during the pandemic as a temporary measure, then suddenly most people started getting some measure of income support, which was absolutely necessary. Um, I think, you know, the, the principle of EI, I completely agree, is, is important that if you cannot find a job, a job, you know, a decent job in your field, then you should get some income support to make a transition. I know in the auto industry, for example, if people get laid off because of uh, lack of supply or whatever for a period of time, EI does what it's supposed to do. It provides a transition for them during that period. But when most people can't access it, and especially in a changing economy, uh, when people in some kinds of jobs can't, can't access it, then I think there is a problem in the original goals of EI are not being met. And so I would argue that when Minister Qualtro looks at uh, permanent changes to EI, she should build on what she has done during the pandemic and understand that those income supports are lifesavers for people. It, to not have them starved in to taking absolutely any job, uh, but rather to be able to get a decent job. Professor, you want to chime in? I'll be very quick because I don't want to you know, drag this out. And I don't disagree with what Peggy just said, but I, there's two points. Um, I, I do challenge that no one qualifies for it. Last year, we paid out $40 billion in unemployment insurance benefits. So that seems like an awful lot of people are getting some, some benefit and some support and help as they should from unemployment. But to the larger issue, I'm not ch uh, disagreeing at all that we have to revisit and restructure um ei yes indeed yes indeed um and we're gonna have to look at gig workers and and the people that were excluded before for sure there's got to be a comprehensive strategic review of unemployment but my point is once we have that review we need to establish bring back the rules that have served us so well for 85 90 years 
and those three principles, you get a percentage of your income so we don't create moral hazard. Number two, you have to be looking for a job while you're unemployed. And thirdly, you can't turn it down. If it's in your area of expertise, in, your, in the area where you live, you can't, reject, you can't turn it down. Otherwise, we're turning it into a backdoor guaranteed annual income. And I know you support that, Peggy, but there's a lot of people that not think- Not necessarily, it's not necessarily. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Sorry. I, I don't want to misquote you. Sorry. <laughs> That's good. I like this. Uh, Brian, let, let's go to another issue before this one gets too heated. The uh, Let's talk about a green economy. So paint me a picture of what the green economy looks like from your perspective and, and, and the other areas where you think that we should make a move. And is Canadians on board all, all across the country or unless it impacts them in a negative way, then, then they're not on board. So Paint me a picture. Sure. Well, this uh, th this leads me to speak about the the op-ed that uh, Andrew mentioned at the at the top uh, that I did with Jerry Diaz recently uh, around the opportunity for Canada to really be a leader, uh, particularly in the transition to zero emission vehicles and more broadly in into electrification. There's a huge uh, uh, transition taking place and Canada happens to sit on uh, massive amounts of mineral wealth that we know is going to be uh, in significant demand as we decarbonize. Um, so I, I like to reference the International Energy Agency. They've done some fantastic analysis of the uh, energy requirements to, hit, to achieve net zero. And right now they're estimating that we're gonna need six times more mineral inputs uh, than we currently have right now uh, by the time we get to 2050. If you look at battery production alone, uh, and, and this is primarily for electric vehicles, we're going to need to grow our mineral output by about 30 times by 2040. This is a, a massive uh, uh, endeavor, um, and we, there's been a lot of talk in Canada about the fact that we have these mineral deposits, but the reality is we've done very little to actually um, move to a point where mining is taking place, and more importantly, processing is happening in Canada to ensure that those minerals can be used in things like batteries. So. I think this is a huge opportunity, but we have to move quickly because the world's moving right now. Investments are being made. China dominates in critical mineral development. Um, they've been at this for decades, so they've got a, a huge uh, head start on us. And that doesn't mean that we can't catch up, but we we better uh, move quickly. And just I just wanted to uh, touch in on the point that Ian made uh, about electrification. I completely agree with him that as we go in this transition, it's going to depend on having more clean energy generation in Canada. Uh, clean Energy Canada just put out a report, it was last week, they're estimating that we need to double our energy capacity in the country by 2050, double. So to give you a sense of what that's equivalent to, that's building 12 Bruce Nuclear facilities. I don't know if you've ever been to Bruce Nuclear, but it is a massive uh, uh, nuclear power plant. And given how uh, difficult it is to do major projects in Canada, I, I have a hard time envisioning a scenario where we can build 12 nuclear power plants in the next 20, 30 years. You could also do this with hydroelectricity, but again, uh, there, the estimate would be the equivalent to 100 or more Site C dams being built in Canada. And so, you know, we know these challenges exist. And I think the, the frustrating part is we're not even really having a conversation yet about how we get there. This is going to be extremely costly. It's going to take a lot of planning. And I'm optimistic it can be done, but geez, we better get the conversation going and have a plan in place because uh, the, the whole transition depends on electricity and uh, it's not something that we can, you know, turn on overnight. Well said, Brian. Maybe, uh, Professor, the same question, but I also would add, uh, you know, as Brian talked a lot about, um, you know, mineral resource development in our mining, um, how do you bring the Indigenous communities in there? Because obviously when you talk about resource development, um, the Indigenous community has been putting some roadblocks, and I see it here in New Brunswick uh, with the current lawsuit that's currently in play, but maybe elaborate more on that. I will, and I agreed with uh, Peggy's uh, comments earlier about uh, Indigenous reconciliation. And I have very uh, clear views, maybe people won't like them, but I am more and more convinced that the only, to answer Brian's question, the only way we're gonna go forward, whether it's pipelines and we agree or not on pipelines, or mineral resource development or timber, it's not, we use these buzzwords, partnerships. How about good old fashioned Indigenous capital uh, capitalism? In other words, co 
owners in the mine, co, and I don't mean 1%. I'm talking significant, serious ownership, whether it's 30 or 40 or 50% ownership. They Because remember, a lot of these minerals are on indigenous lands. And right. so if we want to develop them, then they it's not good enough to hold press conferences and say nice things. We've got to bring them in as full-fledged owners, co-owners of the mine co-owners of the oil or the natural gas or the liquefied natural gas or the pipeline and i think that at that point that's when we can make progress uh, because they will they will understand the indigenous peoples will understand this is a huge benefit to themselves to their children and to their to becoming sustainable because often many of the of the reserves as we know are in very remote areas and they don't have any resort any income coming in of any significance and then they're no longer dependent on the government so i think it's going to be co-ownership of the natural resource not just getting a royalty but owning the thing Great. Peggy? Well, again, I, I uh, alluded to this before that I think uh, greening the economy, uh, there's an intersection with Indigenous reconciliation. And um, right. I don't know that anybody knows exactly what that means yet. I think well, we know when we see it. But uh, Professor Lee is absolutely right. The If we're looking at mineral extraction, a lot of this is on uh, indigenous land, some of it unceded land, uh, and so it doesn't look like anything is going to happen unless the indigenous community wants to make it happen. Um, and you know, so far, let's be frank, they have gotten the short end of the stick on just about any negotiation that has happened, where you know you have a diamond mine or a, um, I don't know, forestry. Uh, industry and and they've been left with pollution and not much in way of economic benefits so i think that there is an opportunity to work collaboratively um and you know improve housing and, and access to clean water and and provide energy sources in a way that hasn't seemed um imperative to kind of the 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 people who do have the resources now and so it is an opportunity and you know maybe the the a silver lining in canada is that the pathway to this massive transformation of decarbonization in our society also offers a way forward in terms of of building a more equitable society because i i think we've we failed in the past to do that so i i don't disagree with professor lee i think that there there's an opportunity for us going forward and i don't see any other way for the for this development to take place yeah. professor did you have your hand raised I, I just want to if i could go back to brian's point because i actually think that this is the core issue about decarbonization and if we can't address it it is not going to happen. And that is the, the creation of alternative energy. I've got similar statistics to Brian. I've seen uh, a much larger number. The estimate I've seen is that we have to re, uh, increase our electricity capacity by two and a half times or fold to three and a half times. And that's more like maybe 50 pickerings. And, and I'm not trying to say that we've got to build 50 Pickerings. I'm just saying I'm using that as a metaphor. And, and yet we saw that, that decision in, in Maine where they, they stopped Hydro-Quebec, Quebec Hydro, uh, from bringing in a completely green energy uh, because they were going to cut down trees to put in the high voltage lines. And it was blocked. And, 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 and we, if we don't, and I'm just using that as an example, I, I see huge barriers to whether it's building uh, high voltage lines or building nuclear power plants, or for that matter, if we say, well, let's all do it with wind and solar. Well, the amount of wind and solar that would be needed is going to be hundreds and hundreds of thousands of hectares. And you can bet there's going to be people who are going to be completely opposed in trying to stop that. And so if we don't develop the alternative gargantuan amounts of electricity, then we are not going to decarbonize because I don't believe any politician of any political party 
is going to say to millions and millions of Canadians in January, so sorry, go freeze in the dark because we're disconnecting your natural gas pipeline. I just don't believe any politician will do it. And, and if we don't have the electricity created, I don't believe any, polit I don't care, NDP, Green, Conservative, Liberal is going to consign millions of Canadians in January to saying, sorry, you can't heat your house, your pipes are gonna freeze, just suck it up. I just don't believe that's gonna happen. We tried the ice storm one winter and we didn't like it very much. Exactly. I lived through it. <laughs> Brian, you want that? Yeah, just a quick point. Uh, totally agree on the generation side. The other piece of the equation too is delivery. And I know Ian, you touched on this, but again, you know, from a, an auto perspective, if you have a fully electrified fleet by let's say 2050, and even then that's not that that's less ambitious than what the government's trying to do now. Our vehicle fleet in Canada would be about 40 million electric vehicles using a very conservative estimate based off what the European Union has has recommended in terms of charging charging points. We would need anywhere between 2 and 4 million charging points across Canada to make sure that people can actually charge their vehicles conveniently. So not only do you have to have the generation side which is critical obviously, but we have to then start building out this grid and this network to charge these vehicles. In Ontario, we can't even agree to put electric vehicle charging into the building code, let alone building the facility. So, I mean, this is this is how early we are into this conversation. We've got a very long road ahead, no pun intended. We do, we do. Andrew, did you have uh, something to add? <clears throat> I've got a couple of uh, quick questions from, from the audience, and I wonder if I could just Go yep. through those, um, and and Don, you can come back to, to some others if we if we still have the time. Um, so one is uh, what are the what are your best ideas for the growth of the green economy? We talked about auto quite a bit. Are there any others uh, you'd like to see either in terms of generating uh, electricity or other kinds of aspects about the green economy? Uh, Peggy, well, I'll start. Yeah. With you. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Well, I'll just I I mean you others have talked about the generation question electrical gener gener generation question i'm going to focus on on um energy reduction and i would say really investing in um uh, public transport infrastructure um you know there was a time when train lines were getting ripped out and and everybody likes to talk about high speed rail but uh rail certainly is uh, a more energy efficient way of of transporting people and so whether it's that or it's um, effective um, bus systems using uh, renewable energy so i think green transportation infrastructure is important the other thing i would argue is building codes we mentioned building codes houses i mean our building codes are so out of date in terms of requiring energy efficient uh, buildings. Uh, there's a huge job to be done just in terms of public buildings, schools, hospitals, uh, mm -hmm. all kinds of public buildings. It's a massive job creator, yeah. but it could also be a source of energy reduction and uh, not to mention private homes. And there are small subsidies for people to um, make their homes more energy efficient, but for all the new home building that goes on, we need to do a much, much better job. And I, I think those are two areas that we could focus on. Thank you. Uh, Ian, your your quick thoughts on, the, on your best ideas for the growth of the green economy? I, I To use a phrase uh, that Peggy used at the beginning, we're going to need a massive amount of government investment. Call it the Marshall Plan for the grid. Uh, call it the moonshot. I don't care what we call it. We're we not, deal. <laughs> let's be clear. We're not, for the people listening, we're not talking a couple of million or a couple of billion dollars. We're talking in the trillions. This country is 8,900 kilometers. And when we talk about rebuilding the grid, that means somebody has to get up on one of those hydro boom trucks and string wire from hydro pole to hydro pole. There are millions and millions of hydro poles in Canada. And we're talking massive amounts of money. And, and with greatest respect to Peggy, because uh, I've heard so many people say, well, mass transit's our solution. The vast majority, 75% of Canadians live in the suburbs. And we do trips across the suburbs to take the kids to hockey or soccer. 
LRT mass transit works on a hub and spoke system from the burbs to the downtown, whether it's Toronto, Ottawa, doesn't matter. And we're not gonna build mass transit across the suburbs from one side of the suburb over to the other side. Mass transit is not going to save us. Electric cars. But, but, but Professor Lee, maybe we need fast. to build less suburbs and have better intensification so that we can facilitate public transit. If we have uh, more intensification, and yes, people want a yard and they want to be able to get to sports facilities, but there are ways of building that where you can bring people together in smaller hubs that do facilitate public transit. But 30 million of us live in the burbs now. We're not going to move them into downtown Ottawa and downtown Toronto. That's my. That's why I have this 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 fantasy of intensification. We're all going to move from the burbs where 80% of Canadians live, and we're all going to move downtown Toronto into the beaches. It's not going to happen, people. It's but just you can not. intensify. You can intensify. Like I have family members that live in Mississauga, and yes, people have these massive lots. Some of these lots you could build six units on. Uh, and then you could get public transportation. I know trying to rip out those swimming pools will be tough, but. <laughs> okay, Brian, very quickly, what's your what's your best idea for uh, growth of the green economy besides the uh, besides automotive? I've I've covered auto well, so uh, I, I've I've got to say it's it's mining and minerals. Um, that's where obviously there's an auto tie in there, but um, we we have the resources, we have the endowments. Um, this is a huge opportunity. If you haven't read uh, Brendan Marshall, he's with the Mining Association, put out a fantastic piece for the Canadian Global Affairs Institute a few weeks ago. Take a look at it and really outlines the case for Canada to be a mining superpower when it comes to critical minerals in this transition. I think it's our biggest opportunity. Okay, last question. You've literally got 30 seconds each. Uh, minimum wage, should there be a federal-provincial joint agreement on, on a minimum wage across Canada? Um, I'll start with you, Brian. <laughs> uh, wow, leave, leaving the tough question. Uh, <laughs> bringing me back to my business council days on minimum wage. Uh, geez, I don't think I have an opinion on whether there should be a federal versus provincial. Sorry, I'm gonna I'm going to punt that to Ian. <laughs> um, I'm tenured and I don't consult anybody, so nobody can do anything except yell at me and do social media against me, but no, okay. it should not be a national minimum wage because the conditions in rural New Brunswick are very, very different from downtown Toronto. And one size does not fit all and it produces injustices. I think you can have a federal okay, thank you. Um, minimum wage. And, and, and Don, Don, there we go ahead. Pardon? I think you can have a federal minimum wage, and, and, and Professor Lee is right. It doesn't cover a massive number of people, but it, it, it and the Liberals have pledged to bring this in, which I think is positive. Um, and then I think they should work with the provinces, and each province should have a minimum wage that is a livable minimum wage with a formula that brings it up regularly so you don't have these massive fights and the people at the lowest end of the of the pay scale are punished for it yeah thanks very much don i'm just going to ask you since you are certainly somebody who's been in politics and is returning to politics whether you have any any priorities you want to just comment on or any last minute reflections well, no, it was a great debate you know especially ending on the minimum wage because we've been living in new brunswick last year the blaine higgs government the conservative government raised the minimum wage by five cents and uh, obviously that backfired on them and that's why they announced a two dollar increase in, in minimum wage for next year so um yeah it's been a, a trying time over the past year or two and i think all governments and and uh, all across the country is learning from it and uh no different here in new brunswick than it is in alberta and everywhere else in the country um i wish we would have had more time to talk about uh, or sometime talk about the aging care because i think when you talk about child care and elder care I think that's an area where it's been really impacted throughout this pandemic and it's it's not an issue that's going to uh, go away soon so hopefully we can do this again and have those kinds of conversations yeah i agree well thank you and uh, thank you don and um for th thanks for moderating um peggy nash it is wonderful to have you on again we miss you in ottawa uh, thank you for the work you've done uh, both as an as a member of parliament and continue to do uh, Ian Lee, thanks for taking time out of your all the other people who demand time to get your your provocative opinions on various important issues. I really appreciate you doing that. And Brian, good luck with the issues you're dealing with, uh, greening and especially in the relations with uh, Canada US, which we didn't really get to very much, but you're at the core of all that. So thank you um, all uh, four of you.
very much for this. Uh, to the audience, hang on there. We're going to be moving to our second session. We'll be talking about Prairie and Western Canadian issues. Um, so again, thank you, all of you. Uh, this was a wonderful session. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And if I can have uh, uh, Sandra Pupatello join us, and we'll get we'll get started with with the second session. Uh, Jim Carr, I hope that uh, you are also on hi andrew can you hear me in the system yes i can hear you sandra good good to hear you can you guys I, see I, and hear me hello I hi Jim. Oh, how are you? hi susan <laughs> it's sandra that's the I, other I, one. <laughs> oh well i can hear you but i can't see you no i've got my my camera showing is on here and i was on and then the control room i think turned the camera off oh I can't control. I okay, Sandra, we'll we'll get you. Now I see, I see you. Now, Andrew, just for you, I had so to. Our producer will get the Sandra back on, and we'll get moving. I think I'm on now. Am I? I don't see you. Is there something that I have to do, Andrew, so that I can? Bring her in. No, no. Can you stay put? And our okay. producer is you're you're just perfect. You're sounding good. And oh, there you, you see are. there's light outside your window. Sandra now. Hi, Sandra. <laughs> Hi. I can't see me. I'm hidden by this little panel. Uh, let me get rid of. Oh, it. just uh, click click the little orange arrow on the top right. There we go. So okay. are we live with an audience yet? We've got an audience. So we just we've just completed an hour long session. I on... heard part of it. I thought it was great. It was nice to see those faces again. It was it was good, and now we're going to have a special discussion with our friend Jim Carr. So um, can I pull off my we, paint? I decided to use this as my background today, since we have the Honorable Jim Carr with us, so he feels close to home. Yeah. I thought I'd show you this marvelous painting uh, yeah. by none other than Andrew Cardozo. <laughs> How's that? Uh, acting as wow. your agent again, Andrew. That's a painting that Andrew did. Uh, anyway, I love it. I see it every day. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much, Sandra, for, for doing that promotion for me. Jim, <laughs> how's that? <laughs> I think the last time you and I were together was at a Pearson event that was honoring Erwin Kotler. Oh, that can't be the last time. I think so. And uh, mm -hmm. I remember Catherine McKenna spoke yeah. because Erwin had been her professor. Well, John was... Turner was there, Andrew. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Uh, and this would have been, what, four or five years ago? John Baird oh, and Olivia oh, Chatter did a wonderful event, yeah. And, and you made a celebration of Erwin Cutler. Yeah. Actually, that was a great night. So, see, you're a longtime supporter of the Pearson Center, so it's great to have you joining us today. Yeah, I can even tell you the uh, the origin of that. It was at Lloyd Axworthy's house in a deep August night in Winnipeg. You're uh, on the air, don't forget. When Andrew and I were <laughs> part of the guest list, and, and uh, historically, a day in August was set aside in the Axworthy backyard uh, to, okay, have a puff of a good cigar and maybe even a soup song of decent scotch to talk about public affairs and the state of the world. And that's where Andrew and I first met. And we talked about the importance of having a progressive think tank. Uh, and lo and behold, here we are many, many years later. So there's something to continuity, isn't there? That's there funny. is, and I've, I, I've got a couple of things I want to say, and, and that particular night was not part of my notes, but I will, I will <laughs> just, <laughs> and, and it was a really interesting way to be discussing uh, public policy because people got quite passionate about some of the issues we talked about, um, but it's a real pleasure to have this session on Prairie and Western Canada issues um, with the Honourable Jim Carr, who has been, as you mentioned, a support of the Pearson Center before we were even the Pearson Center, but really was as one of the thinkers, um, along with his friend Lloyd Axworthy and others in, in Winnipeg, was certainly encouraging us to get going and, and do this and create this think tank. Uh, Jim was first elected to Parliament, to the federal Parliament in, in 2015. He has served in various portfolios, including being the Minister of Natural Resources, the Minister of International Trade, and a special representative to the Perrys. He also served in the Manitoba legislature and was the founding CEO of the 
uh, Manitoba Business Council. Also worth mentioning is that he's also a professional musician and was an oboist in the, is it the Winnipeg Symphony Orchestra? Yes, but uh, that was a thousand years ago. And, oh, but, and, but, and but, you say prof professional, that implies somebody would actually pay to hear me play. Yeah, I don't know. I, I speak about <laughs> professional in terms of the quality of the music, not, not nobody would uh, pay to me. Okay. But I always thought it was a really interesting metaphor because Jim is a real team player. Um, I can't recall anybody doing a solo as an oboist, but the oboist is, the, is one of the instruments that really brings the whole orchestra together, gives it depth, it gives it deep credibility, and, and holds the thing together. Uh, Jim has been a strong team player, whether it was in the Manitoba legislature, in the, um, in, in, in the uh, federal cabinet, uh, or with the Business Council of Manitoba. So, uh, Jim, thank you for being an oboist in so many different ways, and and as you were with us as well at, at, at Pearson. Um, and I just want to say a couple of words about Sandra Pupatello. She's the past chair of the Pearson Centre and is now a member of the advisory board. Uh, Sandra is president of Canadian International Avenues Limited, and uh, most of you will know her as a former minister in the Ontario government, most notably the Economic Development uh, Minister for Ontario. So I want to stop talking so we can hear from both of you. Um, with that, over to you, Sandra, and thank you very much, Jim. That's great, Andrew. So for everyone just joining, I much appreciate my backdrop, a painting by Andrew Cardozo of Parliament, and in honour of the honourable um, member that we're listening to today. Jim, uh, I've been watching you for many years and, you know, I think Andrew was right. You've done more than heavy lifting uh, for the government of the day, uh, for, for governments in the past. And we're, today we're talking about the Western provinces and the prairies. And I don't know if it's because we have some 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 serious issues that have fallen that region for Canada, whether that's forest fires, flooding, it's just always in the news, or it's a China event where all of a sudden they not they're not taking our our pulses, um, and and all of us really have been like whipsaw, like oh my God, it's about Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, you know, BC again, another flood. Um, so it just seems like we're talking a lot about the Western provinces. And it's been difficult. So you being there for as long as you have and so, wearing so many different hats, just mm -hmm. open the floor right now about some of your, your first thoughts when it comes to uh, what the West is dealing with today that's perhaps different from 10 years ago. My first thought is that uh, stereotypes are obstacles to progress. And when you talk about Alberta or Saskatchewan, people conjure up stereotypes of uh, what it's like to be an Albertan. And they're wrong. Obviously, they're wrong because these societies are changing and they're changing rapidly. Uh, there is no uh, one way of thinking in Alberta, regardless of what the stereotypes might suggest. Do people listening to us now know uh, that there is a Nobel Prize laureate who teaches at the University of Alberta, Dr. Michael Houghton, uh, who was instrumental in the discovery of the hep C vaccine. Uh, do people know that Saskatchewan and Alberta are leading the world in life sciences? Uh, progressive politics and progressive movements uh, are alive and well in Alberta and Saskatchewan and Manitoba. So my first comment would be, and it arises from spending oh about a year and a half on the second floor of my house on my super pro computer during the pandemic making great tracks across the region and talking to and listening to producers academics uh, union organizers others uh, about what was happening in those provinces and what impressed me more than anything else uh, was the diversity uh, the intelligence, the capacity to absorb new realities and to take those realities and help develop new policy from them. Uh, so that's my first observation. My second is, uh, yeah, we've been experiencing wallop after wallop. Uh, even now, over the last number of weeks and months, uh, if you look at flooding and drought, at the same time, we had a drought that was so deep, so horrible in Manitoba and in parts of Saskatchewan over the summer, 
that we had to reinvest in time-honored agricultural support programs because our producers were getting absolutely clobbered. Uh, I don't have to tell you about flooding in British Columbia over the last couple of weeks, mm -hmm. forest fires. Uh, you can debate till the cows come home the causes of all of this, and I'm sure we're going to get into climate change issues before too long in this uh, interview. But what we know for sure is that uh, prairie folk and Western Canadians have been forced by dint of uh, climate and weather uh, to resort to extraordinary measures to try to stay whole. And governments have responded. Uh, there has been very good collaboration. And it's also a point worth making that when times get really tough, governments stop bickering because it's obvious that uh, the interest is a common one. Uh, measured by metrics that everybody can understand. Uh, so it's been uh, a traumatic time for many on the prairie, but I also see it as a time of great opportunity, Sandra. And in my experience as a minister traveling abroad, uh, both in natural resources and in trade, that uh, we grow and we produce on the prairie what the world wants and what the world needs whether that is protein, whether it's energy, whether it's the way we organize ourselves as societies. And I'm very optimistic about the future of Prairie Canada for that very reason. So uh, what's my mood? My mood is a combination of uh, really anxious uh, because of what we're having to face, mm -hmm. but very excited about the prospects ahead. Well, you mentioned in a couple of your examples, infrastructure and what's happening to our infrastructure, given some of these climate change. And as you said, no matter what the reason, we're having to deal with it. So from that perspective, um, the role that both the federal, the provincial, to much extent, even local uh, governments really have to get it together to sort out what to do. Uh, when you're talking about drought, it's pretty hard to imagine. You can build all the irrigation lines you want. You need water to pour through them. Uh, so at what what point um, do we say what more can we do is it a level of investment that's sufficient can it happen quick enough and at the same time lots of our conversations keep coming around to reconciliation working with indigenous people in whatever region we are in the country and why often you get stopped up in time because you're trying to do it the right way and yet there is such an urgency to be building infrastructure in so many different ways um how do you think we're faring uh, on that score and and i guess Boy, a comment a, on the you, covered a lot, you covered a lot of ground there yeah. you want me to start with infrastructure or reconciliation or well, water management and i guess okay, I let's start, start with the water management it, and they're mixed right because one uh, they are now uh, in today's government uh, at yeah. many levels, not just federal, there really is a focus where we need to partner with Indigenous people wherever we are and building infrastructure naturally is involving land. So it, it yeah. really complicates things. Yeah, well, uh, I think the greatest lesson or among the great lessons uh, that I have learned from uh, Indigenous people over the years, it's actually very similar to what Jean-Jacques Rousseau said that the fruits of the earth are for everyone, the earth itself for no one. And the respect for land and air and water uh, is a great indigenous teaching. And uh, it's taken the rest of us a long time to figure that out. But we're figuring it out now for good reasons and for reasons that are put upon us by court decisions. But I think basically an understanding uh, that we are stewards of the environment for the time we're here. And we have an obligation for those uh, who came before and those who will come after to leave it in a better place. So we know that in this political environment, and in the reality of reconciliation, that we are not going to develop our resources. We are not going to exploit the land and we are not going to use the natural environment uh, without partnerships with indigenous communities. That is where you start. 
then the debate gets interesting about what that means. You can talk about the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People and the notion of uh, free prior and informed consent. That's where the debate gets intense and political. But what underlies that debate is the understanding that nothing is going to happen in Canada to develop our resources on Indigenous land without co-developing projects with Indigenous peoples. And that's happening. It's positive. And it's also a way in which young people in these communities can see their own futures. And I think for the first time, that has become a point of consensus in the wider political environment in the country. And that's, I think, a massive step forward. On the issue of managing, sorry, go ahead. Did no, I was going to say, you know, just moving into infrastructure and sort of the yeah. time of that, and, and how would you prioritize, which would you do first if you were the king of the world? Uh, you know, is it going to be infrastructure that would assist in the drought of the prairie provinces? Is it the the uh, the dikes and dams around BC right now, given what's happening every, every few months, it seems, with these massive rainstorms? Um, and I... You know, so it's a very difficult position to be in when you're trying to prioritize it. It's all happening all at once. Yeah, uh, you're right. And then uh, even after you have established a set of priorities, uh, then you have to come to terms with the pace of change. Mm -hmm. And the pace of change means the amount of investment that we think our communities can afford. And governments will always be criticized for decisions they make on the basis of the pace of change and the acceleration of urgency. Uh, and when you have to put the urgency of foreign fire, forest fires up against the urgency of floods, against the urgency of uh, drought, uh, then this is why we elect governments, because we have to make these very tough decisions with resources that are not unlimited. So that's where the debate is joined. That's where people will disagree on pace of change, on the quantum of investments. But what we know for sure is that doing nothing doesn't cut it. So we have to move on all of these fronts simultaneously because the forest fires are not going to wait for the droughts and vice versa. So well, yeah. Jim, the panel before us, they talked a little bit about what everyone needs to do. The focus should be on the, on the economy and how we move to a green economy and how that could be beneficial. And for us, everyone talks about EVs and new, you know, even BC hosted a massive hydrogen uh, conference not that long ago, maybe a couple of weeks ago. And this focus on hydrogen is a possible solution. Well, that's more water uh, in terms of use. And so some of these sort of combat each other. Um, if we're talking about EVs, then we have to talk about critical minerals and where are they coming from? And again, that combats other priorities that we've set for either protecting the environment or moving forward for the environment. And it's on a, almost like this is a conundrum here because everything you do to save the environment will cost the environment. So sitting where you've been all these years in different positions, how do you square that? Uh, in these discussions today? Well, you respond to the immediate and the urgent as necessary. You don't wait when there is a drought or a flood or a forest fire to uh, consult a whole bunch of people about what has to be done. We know what has to be done. So then we have to come up with the resources, develop a political consensus to make the investments that are necessary to combat what's immediate and urgent. And at the same time, we have to be looking ahead, not only a year or two, but generationally. And the issues of uh, a changing climate and the urgency of coming to terms with what the globe faces is absolutely the number one issue in the younger generation. My children's generation, I've just come through, Sandra, a political campaign and mm -hmm. knocked on an awful lot of doors. And I can tell you that the number one issue by far among people in their 20s and 30s and 40s and across all the generational divides is the urgency and the intensity of climate change but it's more intense with young people i've spoken to young people who are having second thoughts about having children because they're not sure they want to bring children into this kind of threatened world uh, that's not the way i see life 
that's not the way I see the world. I see it as an endless series of possibilities and of challenges, but I don't want to est underestimate the intensity and the anxiety uh, that it's producing in uh, the younger generation in particular. So what's my advice to uh, those young people who are uh, anxious about their future? Get involved in shaping your future. I spent just uh, a week or so ago some time with the grade 10 class in my riding in Winnipeg. And they had prepared a whole bunch of questions on sustainability. They were thoughtful, uh, they were thought provoking, and they were uh, penetrating and difficult. And after a half an hour or so of conversations, I said, you know, the most important thing you can do, because their questions were revolving around, what am I supposed to do? I want to be able to take personal responsibility for my actions, for my behavior, and my role as a citizen in being a part of moving us, our society forward. And after saying the obvious about don't litter uh, and be very careful about uh, the resources uh, you spend. And by the way, uh, you are all of an age to get a driver's license. I thought that was a gift to me because they were all about 16. So are you getting a driver? Are you getting a driver's license? Oh, you are. Okay, so you're going to be using all that fossil fuel, or are you going to drive your bike, or are you going to walk, or are you going to carpool? And what lifestyle changes are you prepared to make to personally be a part of a lower footprint on the planet? And then to my main point, get involved. And uh, I don't care what political party it might be. Uh, you have a responsibility, if you really care, to personally get involved in change, in policy development, in building the new society under the new rules of scarcity in the planet. So that was my challenge to them. Well, I, and I, I would have liked to sit in, actually. Every time I went to these classes, they would always ask the first question, how much money do you make? <laughs> <laughs> Matter, mine's, mine's a part of the public record. I have yours probably is too. Mine too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, but on that, you mentioned the planet, and I guess that's the point that a lot of uh, what we do in Canada is so aligned with what's happening in the world. Um, and because you've been natural resource minister, you've been a, a representative from the prairies for for many many years. Let's talk about what's going on in international trade, and that the. Yeah bulk of where our pulses go from the prairies, uh, this, these new markets opening up in India where there's a scarcity of water there. So for us to take, uh, for, for them to take our crops that we've already grown with our water is actually helping them with their water shortage, right? Because they're getting food ready-made from Canada, huge markets there. China, same thing, big opportunities there. And yet we've had some speed bumps lately in the world of trade for all kinds of reasons where uh, China's decided, uh, you know, to make erroneous decisions in some instances. Uh, they think that they, they, they have some logic uh, for stopping or questioning or a different kind of inspection. And the same with India. Uh, where do you think we're going? Uh, can't we develop new markets? There's a, this need for protein the world over. And here we are, this basket of food in Canada. Um, if you were the king of the world, where would you go tomorrow that we just are not knocking on the door firm enough? Southeast Asia, and we are. But uh, you may remember, Sandra, that my title, and I guess this maybe one day will be uh, a factoid of a trivia contest of Canadian political history. I've been the only Minister of International Trade Diversification, which was actually part of my title. Uh, and, and though uh, I did spend some time in the United States, uh, knowing that 75%, uh, I don't know what the number is today, it's about that, of our exports go to one country. It's pretty clear uh, mm -hmm. that we had to diversify our export markets. And also it came at a time when we were having this little hmm, disagreement with the Chinese over canola. Mm -hmm. So it was pretty clear to us, and it still is now, uh, that the diversification of our export markets uh, is a very important national value. And we're making some progress, but it's slow because the Americans are so easy to deal with. Uh, you know, you can make an argument, but they're not always so easy to deal with if you want to talk about uh, protectionist policy and electric vehicles and uh, softwood lumber. Yes, true enough. But 
the reality is that that's where most of the trade is. And if you talk to the small business people and the entrepreneurs, it's easy because of language and proximity. And that's why uh, when I was there and uh, it uh, continues to this day, there's significant investment in expanding our trade commissioner service internationally. So if somebody wants to get out of their comfort zone and develop new markets in their business, that there is help from the government of Canada in order to smooth that transition. And it's happening, but it doesn't happen overnight. So the answer to your question is, uh, we have to diversify our markets. And the way to do that is to understand them better and to have the expertise we need to make uh, the movement from what has been customary and orthodox and easy uh, to something that uh, demands a higher degree of risk. So that is happening and it should happen. Do you know which province in Canada uh, is the most trade diversified? It's Saskatchewan. 60% of everything that Saskatchewan produces is exported. And uh, the producers of Saskatchewan have this uh, unquenchable thirst uh, for discovering new markets, and they're very good at it. Uh, so I think there's, again, from a prairie perspective, lots of reasons to be hopeful uh, that we have the expertise, we have the political will, uh, we have the capacity to take advantage of these emerging markets, and I'm sure increasingly we will. Yeah, and, and having had a, a role similar to that for, for several years, it's hard to convince people not to go the easy route, uh, yeah. to go the one that's going to take a lot of time, build new relationships, cost you a lot of money and travel, um, at least initially, and then hope that you're successful. So it's almost like you need the door slammed shut in your face before you finally decide, oh my God, I have to go to a new market. Um, yeah. and, and I think actually our, our commissioners around the world that work for uh, our embassies do a phenomenal job in opening those doors. So I think it's fantastic. And Saskatchewan, actually, I would not have guessed Saskatchewan. I was kind of thinking for a minute, I don't know, Nova Scotia, because their lobsters are going everywhere. That's sort of where my head was going. Um, yeah. but that's actually a great stat. And if I think on that, um, these challenges that are, for whatever reason, the drought, how will that down the road impact what we can expect as an economy out of the West? How do you keep young people interested in these uh economies when we're having this kind of struggle year after year so we kind of face this um dual challenge i mean we've got a shortage of workers uh so all of a sudden people are it, certainly in ontario and in my hometown in windsor where automotive is very strong all of a sudden post pandemic uh, people are changing the way they want to work young people are having a whole new view of what they consider their work to, to should consist of what should their day look like um how is that impacting in the west and in an agriculture community how different is that innovation and uh, people understand that uh, things are not static and the circumstances around which they do business is constantly changing. And that requires adaptation. It's almost one of the forces of nature, isn't it? Adaptation. Mm -hmm. And yes, in, in this case, it's human nature and our capacity uh, to understand that we have to anticipate the changes that will drive our business. And I can remember having meetings with young farmers uh, when I was minister uh, with particular responsibilities of the prairie, and they understood it very well. And they were the ones who were most aggressive about adopting practices uh, and new ways of farming uh, that would adapt to the changing physical environment and also the changing demands of the international marketplace. Very impressive. Uh, and you know that as a government, we are investing hundreds of millions of dollars. It's probably billions of dollars in new farming practices mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. that are part of uh, the climate package of new investment. And young farmers understand perfectly well that this is what has to happen. Remember it was uh, ingenuity uh, and innovation that led to the discovery of the oil sands in Alberta. Uh, just as it is the international entrepreneur now leading the conversation about adaptation 
as we move more and more to renewable sources of energy from Alberta. And I have a lot of uh, faith in the energy of the entrepreneurs uh, to figure out the innovations that will be necessary under changing circumstances. And well, to know that that is a pot of leadership uh, that is really driving transformation and change. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, we cannot talk about the West without talking about Alberta, the oil and gas, and, and, the, and their part of the economy, mm -hmm. and how large a part of the Canadian economy they are. Uh, you yeah. know, and we worry. And, and here, most people won't know that Ontario does a lot of manufacturing for Alberta and the oil sands industry. So, what happens to Alberta matters to the rest of the country. So, they're in this in this you know conundrum, just like so many others these days. That you know, our government and governments before provincial as well, talking about what we need to do, like the introduction of the carbon tax, so that we are all focused on using less carbon. How do you how do you how do you keep talking as a promoter of the oil sands, as a promoter of the major industry coming out of Alberta today, and at the same time, uh, you've got a discussion around how we've got to start moving off of fossil fuel. It's it's very difficult. Uh, but let me just leave that one for you first, and then I've got a couple more questions. Well, uh, you choose your words carefully and you understand what you're trying to accomplish. And uh, what you're trying to accomplish is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions without jeopardizing employment opportunities for young people. I mean, that, that is the goal. Uh, and the pace of change that takes us to where it is we want to be is where the political debate gets difficult. Uh, but it's also uh, increasingly better understood. So uh, I know that uh, Stephen Gibo uh, traveled to Alberta this last week. Mm -hmm. I just had a chat with him a few minutes ago, as a matter of fact, and he said that it went well because people uh, do understand that that is the nature of the discussion, uh, that it is increasing reliance on renewable sources of energy more sustainable ways of extracting conventional energy. Uh, and everything has to be on the table, including, by the way, uh, nuclear power. And I think that more and more you will hear conversations. Another, uh, you'll know this because uh, you're an experienced Ontario politician. How much of Ontario's power generation is nuclear? Well, it's 50%. Because yeah. Well, I was going to say it's 60. That's 50, which is fantastic. Now, the other yeah, third well. is hydro, so we're doing pretty well uh, from a green perspective uh, in Ontario. But you're yes, right. Yes, and of course, in Manitoba, in Manitoba, virtually all of our generation is hydro. Is hydro. Fantastic. I was talking I to Gary wanted... yesterday right. about this and, and nuclear. And what could nuclear do for the oil sands in terms of yeah. eliminating that, you know, 15% of the emissions that come from the actual extraction process and at least make that energy clean uh, would go, go a long way in my, in my view. So, uh, and because we make a lot of uh, nuclear supply in Ontario, we were always promoting nuclear to Alberta uh, as well. But, and I guess that's the challenge that we know that over time, we want to talk about one liter of oil and what you're doing with it today should be very different from what you can do with a leader in 10 years. And that is you use less because your, your other side of the equation is getting so much more pristine in how it's developing, like EV cars, for example, as, as opposed to uh, internal combustion. So the world has to change. And I guess that's where we get into, well, what are they doing in the rest of the world when we're having to bite the bullet is the rest of the world coming up? So are they keeping up with us? And, and post Glasgow, there was a lot of discussion of real disappointment over the outcome. How did you feel after the Glasgow conference uh, when uh, we saw that China was a little bit reluctant to, in terms of moving on coal? And what does that mean? Uh, Ontario got off of coal and we know how difficult it was because you've got to meet new energy challenges as you're pulling off one kind of fuel. Uh, people are going to want to heat their home. So, you know, it's, it is a, it's difficult, but we can't be the only ones who are having difficulties with this. You mean it was the Glasgow half empty or half full? Yeah, what? Well, yeah, that that depends very much on your on your perspective. Yeah. Uh, you know, I I'm one of those who believes in more and more multilateral international cooperation uh, over uh, international issues, and, and I'm prepared to 
sacrifice a certain amount of national sovereignty in order to achieve it. I mean, that is the balance in the bigger picture. Uh, but whenever you sign a trade deal, you give up some form and some element mm -hmm. of national sovereignty. And I think that the issues that uh, face the international community are so complex and so intense and so immediate uh, that is going to be necessary for us uh, to give up some national control in order to meet international objectives. And okay. that's not only true uh, in the field of climate change, I think it's true in national security and across a wide range of public policy issues. And that happens to be, Sandra, my uh, inclination. That happens to be the way I look at how we move the international community forward uh, through in institutions and through mechanisms that require each of the component parts to do our fair <laughs> share, if not more. And, and of course, how about the pandemic? How about the availability of vaccines is a classic example of international responsibility. So I'm in the camp of those who want more rather than less multilateral engagement uh, so that we can uh, improve the odds of making the world a better place for all of us, not only some of us who happen to be gifted with more resources than others. Right, right. Well, and you know, the age old comment, I go, oh, sure, the Western world, we happen to enjoy this sort of uh, uh, luxury living. And now we want to put the tightening belt on everybody else while they're trying to catch up. And and to some extent, that's true. Um, now, I'm assuming that Andrew's jumping in because there's probably some questions from the audience. We couldn't possibly have gone on for half an hour already, have we? Gosh, we may have. Um, too long an introduction then, <laughs> Andrew, because I didn't <laughs> my questions. <laughs> I had some really good questions still to go here. Um, Andrew, well, well, I'm I, I, to offer. If, if, uh, if Jim Carr is, is available, so let, let's go another five, five to seven minutes. If I, mean, I Sure. Is that well, true? Well, well, we were trying to go a little bit sort of west, 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 and then very west. So I wanted to ask a couple questions about uh, Vancouver, in particular, the Port of Vancouver. Uh, it's been in the news quite a bit lately. Um, and I've been involved in some of these discussions around the supply chain. And, and I mean, I think Christmas is going to show the whole world about supply chains and everything you yeah. can't get. Uh, in time to wrap under the tree. Um, but do you see some opportunities in infrastructure in the Port of Vancouver, in particular with everything that's coming from the east into Canada? Um, you know, the the, um, the difficulties of the LA Long Beach ports, uh, are there opportunities that maybe are gonna open the door this time that we've resisted? Uh, and some of that, I guess, uh, suburbanite growth uh, really hampers the opportunity to improve things at the port or infrastructure like rail or road uh, and that is almost the exact office opposite of what we were just talking about in terms of the environment <laughs> you don't want to uh, sort of lead with um, let's just have more cars and more trucks on the road uh, so we do have to do things in a better way yeah and uh, we've uh, invested uh, 4.1 million dollars just over the last number of weeks in the port of vancouver but it's not the only port in the country. I'm a Manitoban, so you know what I'm gonna say now. Uh, the Port of Churchill. Uh, and the Port of Churchill has tremendous potential. And you know that this is the two-headed monster of climate change. Uh, because while the rail bed is softened by warming temperatures, Hudson's Bay is opening up. And the climate scientists say that Hudson's Bay will be open water in a generation. Well, look at the opportunities that that is going to present to Canada's capacity uh, to deal with the world. Uh, and if you look at all of the studies that have been done uh, of the economic opportunity of sending our goods north, you'll see that the future of Churchill is going to be very, very bright. And it's going to open up east and west uh, much greater possibility uh, for the country in many many ways mm -hmm. uh, labor peace is important uh, you know labor peace at the ports is an issue uh, we have to find better ways of ensuring that there are fewer disruptions and then of course just when you think you've got all of that under control you get these natural events 
like flooding out of the Kokolala, Kokohala, uh, mm -hmm. so that cut off the interior of British Columbia. Uh, so you're constantly having to adjust to changing circumstance. But I think the long-term answer in part is to enhance uh, the capacity of the ports we have and to develop the nascent ones that have so much potential. Wow. Well, listen, I just want to say when we've got a guest like uh, the Honorable Jim Carr with that wealth of information, I mean, you're like a, a walking dictionary when it comes to the history, not just of the West, frankly, but whether it's natural resources or the sea, you know, uh, and we just appreciate that you are so active and that you're prepared to give your thoughts uh, to what goes into the work at the Pearson Center, because it's, it's really helpful for all of us just to get a chance to brainstorm a bit uh, and to listen to some of your wise words. So we appreciate you, Jim. Well, Sandra, it's my pleasure, and I'm always glad to uh, share a prairie perspective with anybody who's interested enough to listen. Excellent. And, and Andrew, um, thank you, my friend, for your continuing leadership, your curiosity, your capacity to reach out to others, and I'm just uh, delighted to be a part of it. And thank you for the invitation and the opportunity. Super, Andrew. Over to well, you. Thank you. I'll, ma I'll email Jim the rest of the questions. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will. I, I, I want to thank Jim as well. We've gone well over your time, and I hope you haven't missed a, uh, a vote in the House or that the government just fell seven minutes ago because you, you didn't show up. <laughs> well, at least so, I'd know but, who to blame, wouldn't I? <laughs> <laughs> but no, th thank you for, uh, in terms of the Pearson Center, for. Uh, you know, coming joining us at least once a year and for joining us so early in this term. And I know it's a very hectic week in Ottawa, so I really appreciate you joining us here. But uh, for your continued uh, service to Canada and your continued uh, education of the rest of the country about the prairies in Western Canada, I think um, I think it's an awfully important role. So so very much uh, appreciate your, your time and your presence here. And we look forward to doing this more often. Excellent. Thank you, Sandra. Wonderful to have you sharing a session. See you. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you.